Please turn with me once again in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Our preaching this Sabbath morning will be on those 15 verses we read earlier in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 down to verse number 15. And we're going to be looking at this section of God's holy word under the following title, The King's Victory. The King's Victory. In the Bible, we have what are called four gospels, these four gospel accounts that have been given to us almost 2,000 years ago, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each gospel has been given to us for a particular reason. They're all different. They all have the same truth, but they all have a different angle or perspective at which they are looking at the Lord Jesus Christ and at his life on this earth. They all look at it from a different focus or a different perspective. Now, I think many of us can see this with Luke and John. Those are very different from each other. They focus on a different part of Jesus's life. Luke, for example, begins right back at the beginning, at the birth of Jesus Christ. John begins really from eternity past. But I think where many of us may struggle, and I know that the church has struggled with this for many centuries, is the difference between Mark and the difference between Matthew. I think so often we can treat Mark as if it's just a shortened version of Matthew. I hope this morning that we will see that Mark has a very important emphasis to point out to us. Matthew's gospel very much focuses on the fulfillment. You'll see it many times in Matthew's gospel. Fulfillment of the scriptures. This is the one that they had been waiting for. Yes, this is spoken about in Mark's gospel as well. But very much in Mark's gospel, there's a very particular emphasis it's a very challenging gospel. It's a very fast-paced gospel. And it confronts people about their false views of the Messiah and their false views of discipleship. It's a very challenging gospel that confronts us of what we may think about Jesus, who is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And as there are many false views about Jesus, who is the Christ today, there were 2,000 years ago as well. There were many, even in that generation, that were looking for the Christ to come. Many are still wrong in our day. So this morning, let us look to this victorious king. This victorious king and it's really at the beginning of this gospel, we see the announcement of a victorious and conquering king coming forward, but not in a way that the world would expect a king of such a nature to come. It's not the way the world would see victory. And this is why it's so important that we are challenged by such an account that Mark gives us. It challenges us to see what victory truly is in Jesus Christ. Not the victory that the world offers, but that the victory that Jesus had over his enemies in his own way, submitting to his Father. So our first point this morning, as we look at these first 15 verses of Mark's gospel, first point is a sure victory. A sure victory. Or you could put it another way, a certain victory or a guaranteed victory from eternity past. And we see this in verse number one, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, the son of God. 
this account, the beginning of which it's called the gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what does gospel mean? We hear the word many times, good tidings, good news. And what is this good news? Or could we ask this question another way? Who is the good news? Well, the good news is of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the good news. He's not, it's not merely a way just to get to heaven. Jesus is the good news. What he did was good news. What he did for sinners is good news to those who believe him. The gospel of Mark is about Jesus. His life. His death. And yes, indeed, his resurrection from the dead. He is, as verse 1 tells us, Jesus Christ. As we saw last Sabbath day, this name Christ is not just his surname. This is the Christ. This is the anointed one that the Jewish nation were looking for, were waiting for. The anointed one, the Messiah. It is good news, isn't it, for those who believe and turn to this Jesus Christ. Christ. It's good news for what he has done. Because without what Jesus has done, none of us would have any hope. He is that gospel message. He is the great and mighty king that is being announced here. Now, why is the victory sure? We said of a sure, a certain, a guaranteed victory. Here is this victorious king who is coming. Mark's gospel is different. It doesn't begin where often the other gospels begin. It begins very much announcing him as this victorious king, the son of God. Why is that title so important? You know, we have to remember, Jesus never began to be the Son of God. He is the Son of God, always has been the Son of God, always will be the Son of God. But he became man, eternally God from all eternity, without any shadow of turning, without any diminishing in his radiance and his glory and his power at any point, whether that was in the womb of his mother Mary or whether that was at the cross. He was in his divine nature, filling both heaven and earth. Always the son of God, only begotten of his father in heaven. This is so important, friends. Because I think we can forget the importance of this title, the Son of God. We can treat it as if it's just, well, any, any of us are the Son of God. No, it's, it's speaking very specifically of that eternal relationship between God the Father and God the Son. A relationship without beginning and without end. Eternal we mentioned only begotten of the Father. This is why he is the Son of the Father. The roles cannot swap either. The Father is always the Father. The Son is always the Son. In earthly relationships, we see with some like Abraham and Isaac. Abraham begot Isaac. Now that's for creatures. That is for finite creatures who have a beginning and on this earth will have an end. But it's different with God because God is not like us. God is eternal. God is infinite. God is glorious. God fills both heaven and earth. So this begetting of the, the son is eternal. And we also have to remember that there is but one God. The Father is God, yes. The Son is God, but there is one God. 
we need to remember that this really points to the fact that Jesus is as much God as the Father is God. This is something that the early church struggled with. This is something that cults such as the Jehovah's Witnesses struggle with. The fact that he is the Son of God shows that he is God himself because he is one with his Father. And when he declared himself to the Jews to be the Son of God, what would they often do? Lift up stones to cast at him because they knew that it was a blasphemy. They, they saw it as a blasphemy. In John chapter 10 and verse 36, John 10 and verse number 36. It says this, Say of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. I am the Son of God. Also in John 20, verse 31. John 20 and verse number 31. But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. It's, it's so loaded with meaning, and that believing you might have life through his name. If we believe truly, trusting that Jesus is the Son of God, we have eternal life. Because it points to the fact that we say that Jesus is our master. Jesus is the one who has sure victory. Why is he surely victorious in this mission he's been sent to on this earth? Because he is God. He is God. It's in the very first line, announced victory. Friends, could Jesus have ever failed in his mission? Not a possibility. Not even a possibility. Friend, this morning, do you trust his good news? Do you see that it's good news? Do you see this light shining uh, in the midst of darkness? And the darkness was that generation that did not bow before him. He is God. He is surely victorious. Our second point this morning is this. A scriptural victory, a sure victory, but also a scriptural victory. It is a victory that the law and the prophets had revealed centuries before. It says in verse number two, as it is written in the prophets. And then it quotes, behold, I send my messenger before thy face we shall prepare thy way before thee. This is the account given by Isaiah and also by Malachi. What was happening was according to the scriptures, the word of the living God. And it was very important to point that out because what the scriptures say will happen, happens infallibly without error. The word of God is powerful, and it's so important, isn't it? And you see this all the way even throughout the New Testament, quoting of the Old Testament, and other parts to show us we must have confidence in the word of God. We must have confidence in the scriptures. Holy men wrote as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. If we do not have confidence in what is written, this more sure word of prophecy, what do we have? The devil will gain a foothold in our lives. What did he say to Eve in the garden? Yea, hath God said. The first tactic of the enemy against Eve was to make her doubt 
the word of God. We must have confidence in the word of God. And it's something that is so important to point out today because I fear, dear friends, we have largely lost it. There is so much confusion when it comes to the word of God. It is very common today to have people tell you, well, you decide what the text says. That is a recipe for disaster. We bow to the word of God. It does not bow to us. In the prophets, what does it reveal? It reveals, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. It shows the sure word of God. It shows how this was expected all along. It says what would happen, and it happens. John the Baptist would come. John the Baptist would come in the spirit and power of Elijah. He would come and prepare the way of the Lord with his victorious message. This message which would have the victory over his enemies. Of this victorious king who would follow after us. And what is the message? The message of the coming king is this. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. In the ancient world, centuries ago, what would happen? A king would come to visit. He would come to visit his people. But what would be the difficulty for him coming to visit his people? It would be in the roads and the valleys and the hills and all those things that would get in the way and become obstacles to the visit of the king. How could the way be prepared? All the obstacles to be removed, all these valleys made low, all these paths made straight, all point toward what is, you could say, keeping the king from visiting with blessing rather than judgment. And we see it even with what the people are doing in verse 5. And there went out unto him in the land of all Judea and of Jerusalem. were all baptized of him in the river Jordan. Confessing their sins. Confessing their sins. It was a very hardened generation. It was a very stubborn and religious generation. That needed to turn to the Lord. It needed to Remove, you could say, these valleys and these, make these paths straight. This generation spoken about in the Gospels, they thought they didn't need to repent and turn from anything. They struggled with the idea that there were sinners at all. They thought, oh yes, those Gentiles out there, those, those heathen nations, those who don't confess that Jehovah is God. Oh, the Samaritans, they need the gospel. But they didn't see that they needed it themselves. Friend, do you see your need of the gospel message? It's so easy. It is so easy to think that the gospel is just for those people out there. We need the gospel. We're sinners. We fall short of the glory of God. We have sinned in thought, in word, and in deed. And we need to have confidence in this message, don't we? The gospel message. And our confidence in a gospel message will largely have the foundation of our confidence in the scriptures. Could it be in our day, because of our loss of the confidence of the scriptures, we've also lost confidence in the gospel to convert people? Because what has been replaced with it has been entertainment and all the things of this world. We must have confidence that this is the word of God. Thus saith the Lord to state it boldly and confidently. Here is the word of God. Years ago, I was... I came to Reformed theology, I think about a little bit over 10 years ago, through reading John Calvin and other people. And I was amazed 
absolutely amazed that it was very common in modern day reform circles to deny large sections of the New Testament. The beginning of John chapter 8 in the Mark 16. I say that not to condemn brothers. This goes right back to men like B.B. Warfield and others. But I say it as we're in trouble. I talk about the reformed world in, in, in general. We have to have confidence in the scripture before us. If we don't have confidence in the scripture before us, that God has kept his word pure in all ages, what do we have? And we won't have confidence in what has been declared to us from the pulpit. We'll hear it as the word of men, not as the word of God. And friends, you may have heard many clever sounding arguments of why parts of the word of God have been corrupted. It is a lie. It may be believed by godly men, men air, but we must have confidence in the scriptures that are right before us. Trust what God has promised because it's a scriptural victory, friends. It is a scriptural victory over the enemy. Our third point this morning is a servant's victory. A servant's victory. So a sure victory, a scriptural victory. Number three, a servant's victory. Serving. The will of God brings victory. And notice how I said earlier that this seems so contrary to the world. Those kings of old who would conquer, they would come by doing their own will, not this king. He comes not to do his own will, but the will of his father. That's how he comes to conquer. In verses 7 and verse 8 of our text, and preached, and this is speaking of John the Baptist, and there cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist sees himself as a lowly servant. This is the way to victory. This is the way to defeating the enemies of the gospel, not to say I'm so much better. No, he sees his role as the lowest menial of all servants, and it is a wonderful privilege to do so. The picture here we see of there cometh one mightier than I, after me, verse 7, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. This is a very understood phrase in that time. Men, masters of homes, would walk out in the dirty streets, their shoes filthy. And the lowest of tasks was to unloose the master's shoe so that he would gain a degree of comfort. That was the lowest of all tasks. And John the Baptist says, I am not worthy to even do this. Because so much greater is Christ. For he is the son of God. Whose baptism is greater? John comes with a baptism of repentance. Jesus comes with a far greater gospel. Verse 8, once again, and he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. That powerful baptism from on high. That is victorious preaching. John the Baptist's ministry was victorious preaching. He made much of Christ. He made little of himself. He advanced the kingdom, and through that, the kingdom advances. Now, to the eyes of the world, they can't see victory. The eyes of the world can't see what is so special about the cross. But the eye of faith sees here coming forward one victory after another. 
Jesus coming and placing the enemy under his feet. One victory after another. It was one of service. It was one of lowly and meek service. And he went forward serving his father. Verse number 11. How did the father see the service of his son? Verse 11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Now we know from eternity past that the father delights in the son and the son in the father. And they enjoy that sweet communion. They lack nothing, one with another, from all eternity. But this is very much speaking in the context of the son's service to the father. Why was he baptized? Jesus was baptized in verse number nine, and it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. Why was he baptized? Jesus was not a sinner. All the others who came being baptized in verse five, it says, confessing their sins. Jesus had no sins to be forgiven of. We turn to Matthew chapter three, Matthew chapter three and verse 13. Matthew chapter three and verse number 13. Down to verse number 15. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him saying, now John is struggling with this as well. You may be struggling with this here this morning as well. Why did he need to be baptized? I have need to be baptized of thee. Comest thou to me? Verse 15. And Jesus answered, said unto him, suffer it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. To fulfill all righteousness. Jesus came to keep the law of God in the place of his people, whom the Father has given him. And this service... This servant's victory pleased the Father in heaven. Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You're going to notice a pattern in this Gospel of Mark. It's victory over victory. Why? Because this is pleasing before the Father. Why? Because the Father is greater than all. Because the Father is powerful, glorious, full of truth. He served. And to the world, to serve the will of another seems weak. But it is the most powerful thing to serve and obey God, to follow in the footsteps of our master. We'll never do it like Jesus. We'll never do it exactly like him, but we seek to be like him, don't we? We wish to be like Jesus, but we fall short. I heard a preacher one time explaining. There was a time when he was growing up. He was walking behind his father in the, in, in the snow. His father was had bigger feet and you could see the, the markings of his shoes in the snow. And his son wanted so much to follow in the footsteps of his father. So he jumps he can't quite make it, but he's trying with everything he has to keep up with his father. He can't. He can't, but he still seeks to follow in the footsteps of his father. That's us. That's believers in Jesus Christ. Yes, we don't keep up with him, but we seek to follow him and to be like him, to follow in the footsteps of of the Lord Jesus Christ dwell upon this earth. And his way was the way of victory. What happened? Verse 12, 
and immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. This is a very fast-paced gospel. And then verse 13, he's driven into the wilderness. And very briefly, in verse 13, it deals with 40 days. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts and angels ministered unto him. In submitting to the Spirit of God, he's driven into the presence and tempted of the enemy. But what does he do in those 40 days? He succeeds where Adam failed. Adam submitted to the devil. The Lord Jesus Christ submitted to his Father in heaven, and he had victory after victory after victory, being meek and lowly. Do you see the path of victory, friend? Perhaps you're here this morning and you think, you may think you're too good to be humbled, to serve God in some way. Is there any role too low for us to do? Jesus himself Wash the feet of his disciples. No, it's not to say that we have to do feet washing ceremonies thousands of years later. The point was Jesus himself was willing to do those tasks. The most menial and lowest of tasks. Are you willing to serve in whatever capacity the Lord would have you serve? It may not be the role you would choose for yourself. Usually it's not. Usually you think, oh, I don't want to do that. But the Lord has placed it upon your heart to serve in some way. Maybe it is in the hospitality of others. Maybe people who are visiting the church for the first time. Maybe it's reaching out to the lost. And all these things will be things that don't come naturally to many of us. But are we willing to serve because it's through service of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, there is victory. And I think it's also important that we point out as well, the great temptation in our day is worldly comfort. Worldly comfort. We have such nice homes. We have such well-heated homes. We, we are so comfortable. And the great temptation of that is we become about ourselves and serving ourselves. But we must not be about the glory of this present world. We may not think we're doing that. We must be about the glory, the greater glory of the world to come. Whether that's sharing the gospel, whether that's helping people, whatever the case may be. But it's a servant's victory. Our final point, number four, is a suffering Victory, a suffering victory, a sure victory, a scriptural victory, a servant's victory, and finally number four, a suffering victory. We see victory after victory. The Lord, through various means, is victorious, but he suffered. There's a suffering that takes place here. The angels minister to Jesus because why? He suffered. In verse number 13, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. It's very much the emphasis in Mark. Yes, of this victory, but also of the suffering that is part and parcel of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It is the norm in this world. John the Baptist, what did he endure? He serves Christ. He is a lowly servant. What happens to him? Good things in this world? Well, verse 14 says, no, after that, John was put in prison. John was put in prison. In this world, there are still forces 
that are not fully and finally defeated. Yes, all enemies, sin has been defeated at the cross, but the kingdom will advance through the preaching of the gospel, through the service, through means such as the people of God serving God, other things like that, put under the feet of Christ. But that last enemy is not yet fully and finally put under the feet of Christ. We turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And verse number 26. Verse number 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. We still live in a world with death, don't we? So we're still at that point in time. We still await for the time when the kingdom will advance, when Christ will return. So speaking of but when Christ will return and the enemies will be placed under his feet. Suffering comes with the way of service. We have to realize this. I think in the early church, there's a possibility they romanticized suffering too much. They almost sought it out. But they wished for the greater glory to come. When you think of early martyrdoms, Polycarp and others, they were so glad to be out of this world in which they suffered, to enter into a world where they would not suffer. In Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 33 onwards. Now, Hebrews chapter 11 is almost a hall of fame of those who were faithful in the faith. These were saints of old, remembered, and still remembered thousands of years later. But it says in this chapter, in verse 33 of Hebrews 11, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the, the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were, were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. Now, when we think of persecution, we often think of torture and physical pain and other things, and that may come in pursuing the gospel in our day. But you will suffer persecution in this world. Most of what we will endure in this world is not always physical pain. It is usually the mocking, reviling, the false accusations of this world. You may be in a job situation where people misrepresent your Christian faith and spread lies about you. These are the kind of things that a servant of Christ must be willing to endure because if we run away from suffering, friends, we will also run away from service. Now, none of us choose to suffer. None of us really want to suffer. Even the Lord Jesus Christ did not seek to suffer, but he was willing to suffer. He was willing to serve and endure all that came with it. Verses 14 and 15. Jesus came in the wilderness. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. What is so significant about this? Right after John is put in prison for preaching the same message, what happens? Oh, no, no, it's too dangerous now. Things are, the message keeps going forward. It must. It must. And it's almost what is being said here. 
Yes, people will suffer along the way. Yes, people will be persecuted and suffer martyrdom and all the other things that will happen. But the gospel must continue to be preached, come what may. Because in preaching, because in going forth, there will be new enemies. But friends, there will also be new victories. Suffering victories, but victories nonetheless. The world may look at it and it doesn't look like a victory. It looks like torment. It looks like defeat. It looks like something that we would want to run away from. And we listen to the world and we become dismayed and discouraged. But that's what the victory looks like in this world. Imprisonment. There are, and I think there currently still is, a minister in China, because he spoke the truth, is currently serving many years in prison. That is still the reality for many of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. And they're not going to tell their neighbors why they're in prison. They're going to tell them, oh, he did something bad. Friends, we must not idolize comfort. We must seek God. This victorious king presented and announced in these first 15 verses, is he the king you love? Is he the king whom you serve? Is he the king whom you wish to follow? Wherever he will lead you, do you see his victory in himself, first and foremost, because he is God. We must not forget that. The very foundation of all this victory is the fact that he is God, the Son of God in verse 1. But it's also according to his word. Are we in this daily? Do we love the word of God? There were people who would smuggle Bibles centuries ago and it's still a reality around the world, risking their lives to translate the scriptures, men who willingly gave their lives to translate the scriptures into the language of the people. They valued the word of God because they saw that this victory going forward was scriptural. But it's also in service. It's not for our kingdom. It's not for our own will. It comes to the will of Almighty God. And it comes at a cost. If you're following God, you may not even think about it at times, but it has cost you. It may have cost you friends. It has cost you influence. It may have cost you business opportunities. And it may cost you other things in the future. But it does cost Whatever it costs, friends, whatever we lose in this world, we gain far more in the world to come. Amen. Let us pray before Almighty God. Glorious and heavenly King, our victorious Father, we look unto thy Son, who is victorious over his enemies. We look unto him, the Son of God, powerful and glorious, only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. True light from true light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. O oh Lord, we look unto him, and we see victory. May we follow in the footsteps of our Savior. May we follow him in the footsteps which Scripture has laid out before us. May we follow him in the footsteps of service before thee, seeing it as a privilege to do the most menial and lowest of tasks that thou would have for us to do. And may we be willing to forego all the comforts of this world to follow thee. May we be willing and glad that we would pray and cry out, not my will, O God, not our will here, but thine be done. 
pardon our many sins. We fall short in so many ways. But thou art merciful. May we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.